All right. I want to um, welcome everybody to the uh, Friday, July 24th uh, virtual Cup of Joe with your town manager, Paul Balkaman. And we have two special guests here uh, from the Amherst Area Chamber. The director of the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce is Claudia Pasmani and the Amherst Downtown Business Improvement District Director, Gabrielle Gould. So welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you. you. We, um, we are trying to channel our, our favorite coffee situations. So um, I'm at Share here, and I think Claudia is <laughs> down at Cushman's. Um, we couldn't be there in person, but we're, we're trying to make that work. Before we um, get started and start taking questions and inviting you all into the room, I'm going to give a few moments for your town manager to give any updates and then um, the same for both of our guests. So, Paul. Hi, everybody. Good morning. It's early and um, welcome to Claudia and Gabrielle, two of the hardest women, working women in uh, downtown Amherst, uh, excluding town hall. Excluding town right. hall. Uh, <laughs> um, just a lot going on. We appreciated that the town council passed the uh, FY21 budget on Monday, which is really excellent news. Um, really, um, the leadership of Lynn Griesmer is really helpful in moving this whole thing forward. So we have a budget. We have a you know our plan to go forward. Um, and one thing we know is that is probably going to change uh, because things are changing so rapidly, and we'll probably be back looking at capital items in the budget um, again in the fall. We fully expect that and so the council fully understands that. So this is gonna be an ongoing conversation because we just don't know where the pandemic is carrying us and what, our, uh, what, what we're looking at in terms of revenue for the town, what the economic situation the town is gonna be. And that's something we can talk about this morning because uh, uh, Claudia and Gabrielle have their fingers on the pulse of the town better than anybody, absolutely anybody. So I just uh, thank the council for passing the budget. And there's a lot of, a lot of other things going on. I'm hoping to and talk about anything that people want to and listen to people if they have thoughts on things. And I'll, and I'll take that opportunity to remind everybody um, to all of our attendees in the room, you can use the Q&A function within Zoom to put a question in the room. We'd love to hear from you live, however. So if you feel comfortable, uh, raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine from the phone so you can come in and. Um, chat with the the team here and i'm sure most of the people in this room know both the the bid in the chamber uh claudia and gabrielle but i'd love for them to just um have a chance to give an update on their orgs so um gabrielle is in my top left corner on my screen so i'm going to have her go first good morning um so paul's right we've been busy um <laughs> we have been <laughs> running our own organizations um, and as well uh, have been sort of pivoting and creating the Downtown Amherst Foundation into the micro grant fund that has um, helped over 60 businesses in the Amherst area. Um, my area is the Business Improvement District, so pretty much right downtown or exactly right downtown. And the chamber is a wider swath, uh, and I'll let Claudia go into that. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to answering questions and talking about what we've been up to, um, but I can assure you that over the past five months, I don't think anybody's had a full day off. <laughs> and Claudia? Good morning. Thank you for having me. I wish I was at Cushman right now, but I do go every morning and I will be there promptly after this meeting, uh, but we can't be inside quite yet, uh, but they are doing all the safety protocols. Um, they are just, I'm so proud of all the hard work that our owners are doing right now. And that is also what kept, has kept Gabrielle and I busy working with owners to keep them, to keep their protocols and also to make our consumers and our, our families aware of what they're doing to make things safe for you to go. Um, I think the biggest piece that Gabrielle mentioned is obviously funding for our, our businesses, anything we can do to help them. And we've gone as far as to also additionally provide PPE for them, um, guidance, whatever they need, handholding, whatever. Um, we've worked on grants together with the town as well. We're very appreciative of this. Uh, this has brought us all very close together, which I'm so appreciative. And But that creates a lot of power um, in terms of accumulating some cash <laughs> for, you know, acquiring anything that our businesses need from tables and umbrellas and so forth. So it's really been um, a challenge. And so that will continue. New CDBG funding has been announced. And um, so hopefully some more businesses will benefit. So we're not done yet. Um, and I think the, obviously the focus right now is working with our universities, our schools, our colleges are now all returning 
um, and with the reopening plans. Um, we want to be a partner in that and provide the safest possible return for our, of our students to our community. And we know that's a big concern. So masks, masks, masks. <laughs> so what's so strange is a few years, a few weeks, months ago, no one know what, knew what PPE meant, what social distancing meant, and now it's just a normal part of our vocabulary. So PPE is personal protection equipment. And what it used to be things that we thought of like as hazmat suits, but that's not what it is. It's gloves, masks, things like that. Sanitizer, um, yeah, yeah, all of that. And it is, it's an extreme cost that you don't really think about. And I don't think these businesses um, had any idea what was coming to them. And if you look at a restaurant situation or a barber situation or a hairdresser where they have to constantly change their masks and their gloves, it adds up really fast. And just the amount of um, money that our businesses locally have had to spend to pivot and to change into what they are, um, even just takeout containers are so cost prohibitive when you really think about, you know, what the margin is. So being able to, through the chamber, the bid and the DAF purchase uh, PPE um, in bulk and get it. Uh, that's another thing. It's hard to get still. Um, some things are very easy and they come and then all of a sudden next thing you know there's a run on masks again and you can't get anybody masks. So we're very fortunate to have gotten that in bulk and we've, um, we've actually had a really nice time with our masks on going to each individual business and bringing them their packages of PPE. It's, it's, we've all been um, socially distanced for a long time. So to be able to knock on a door and place this down and step six feet apart and have a conversation with the business owners has been really um, valuable to us. And it's helped us be able to assess what they need more Mm -hmm. um, it's one thing to make a phone call or to send an email, but it's really been this person to person is, you know, always best as we all know. I'm going to just take a second to um, remind the room to feel free to raise your hands. I see um, a lot of you out there raise your hands or um, pop a question in the Q&A at any point so we could put it to our expert guests here. Um, okay. Well, and to that point with Paul, that the PPP is another new part of our vernacular. <laughs> I, do see, I do see Jeff um, in the room, so I'm going to put Jeff, um, pull him in and just ask Jeff to unmute and introduce yourself. Good morning, uh, Jeff Lee, Amherst resident. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for meeting today. Um, I was just wondering, I see a wide range of compliance with mask wearing in public places. I was wondering if the town's considered doing more enforcement of the mask wearing guideline. Uh, th thanks, Jeff. That's a great question. I think it's something we get asked a lot about. Um, so right now we're aligned with the state in terms of the mask wearing. And what the mask wearing rule is, is if you cannot socially distance, you must wear a mask. And then there's all these exceptions if you have respiratory issues and things like that. Um, the Board of Health on Monday is going to look at a mandatory mask um, regulation that will require people to wear masks, uh, not advisory, but it require people to wear masks downtown Amherst and maybe in other sort of areas where social distancing isn't quite as easy to do because our sidewalks are narrow. There's a lot of people on the streets. Um, and I think their view is they want to designate specific areas as opposed to if you're walking down Southeast Street, you don't need to, by yourself, you don't need to have a mask on at that moment in time. But if you're walking downtown, you turn a corner, you might bump into somebody. Um, so we really want you to have masks and also just uh, to create a unity, a unifying way of approaching things. Um, in terms of enforcement, enforcement's very touchy. We've seen this around the country become very uh, controversial. So our, our intention is to have um, uh, ambassadors that are going to have boxes of masks that they can offer to people, um, educating people, especially as students uh, and uh, faculty return to, to town. They, nobody may, be, may not be familiar um, with the mask wearing guidance. We have a bunch of signs coming in about uh, wearing masks and social distancing and things like that. And then if the Board of Health to actually does establish a regulation saying that you must wear masks, we'll have additional signage at the entrances to those areas. You know, I'm thinking it might be aligned with the bid um, boundaries, maybe um, in the village centers, things like that. So um, 
we, we will have the ability to enforce. We really don't want to start writing tickets for not wearing masks. We really want to, and we really want to um, encourage compliance um, with mask wearing by um, offering them. And that's, you know, um, we've talked about this with the university and their first instinct is to educate um, sort of the walk this way um, program that we have with, the, with this university. And that's worked very well because students um, when, are not like, I don't want to wear a mask. They just may not be aware of it. So just helping guide students along, uh, newcomers to town, visitors who are visiting college campuses, you know, rules are different. And that's the problem is that you go from one city to another, one state to another. You don't know what the rules are. I couldn't tell you what the rules are in Vermont, honestly. Do I have to wear a mask in Vermont? Do I not? I don't know. And unless someone helps you along the way, you just don't know the rules. So that's what the point is, is to um, create an environment downtown where the norm is that everyone is wearing a mask. So that it creates a safe environment for anybody who wants to come downtown. Uh, they know that, that everybody, will, that the norm is that people will be wearing masks. Thanks. Have, you, have um, I was wondering, can I add to that? Do you mind? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> sure. Um, I think, well, Gabrielle and I, both the bid and the chamber are also <clears throat> um, partnering in terms of sending out that messaging. We are absolutely supportive of that mandate. We will do any shared messaging that we need to do to accomplish that. Um, I've already been asked by uh, one of the teams at UMass for the, some of the off-campus students that are coming to prepare a sent message to distribute to those students. And most of those will be, it's, it's actually their international off-campus students. So again, that'll be a group that, um, a targeted group of off-campus folks that I know has been, um, you know, people of, of concern. So I'm really excited that we have an opportunity to again, share our messaging and to make that happen from the start. So what, you know, from day one, they know that masks are required. And just to add on, uh, you know, absolutely supportive of this, and I think what it does is it just sets the comfort level for consumer confidence to come into our downtown and support our local businesses who so need that. Um, and I think anecdotally, yesterday I was helping Rachel, uh, the new owner at Pasta y Basta, who is opening tonight for outdoor dining, in case you don't have dinner plans. <laughs> um, we were setting up, and as I was walking down Main Street to her place, um, a, a couple in their 50s walked by without masks. Um, six uh, high school students clearly were behind me. They all had masks on and I watched them walk. I watched them look at the couple without masks, all look at each other and two of the girls took their masks off. And I thought, yeah, that's interesting. You know, um, our, our younger people are going to look to, the, to us and say, well, what are the rules and what am I supposed to do? Um, so it was really interesting to see those masks come off when, you know, two people who could have been their parents walked by without them. So I think it's going to be a really great thing for our downtown area and, and our town centers. Thank you. You're very Thank welcome. You. Thank Thanks you, Jeff. for being here, Jeff. Yeah. Okay. So I have a question and a comment from Sarah. Um, she wants to know what are the rules for takeout cocktails? And her comment is, it seems like public drinking could increase. Thoughts? Um, I mean, I will tell you that the rules are is that you're still not allowed to have an open container or publicly consume alcohol. Um, this was a way for uh, Baker to help our restaurants a little bit more and um, have it so you can, you know, I don't know about a lot of people, but most people I think have a couple of key things in their homes, but don't really know how to make a uh, Negroni or, uh, you know, maybe that's an easy one, but, you know, some more complex cocktails. So, you know, I think about bartenders like Jeff at Asteria Vespa, who's just amazing. And the fact that if my husband and I have a date night, we can not only order some great food from that restaurant, but Jeff can make us a couple of cocktails. They'll be sealed in baggies. And then we can take them home, shake them over some ice and enjoy them in the comfort of our own home. Um, I don't see this in any way becoming a New Orleans type situation anywhere in Massachusetts. Our laws here are very strict, but I do think Governor Baker did the right thing by making this possible. Our restaurants, our retail, everybody needs all the help they can get. So can you get takeout cocktails now is the question. Yes, you can. Yes, I think the intent um, is that they are required to be taken home. I mean, that is they are. the intent of they the are law. Required or, or um, you know, uh, enjoyed on premise. So, um, you know, I know Mission Cantina is saying, you know, do you want that in a glass or do you want that in the baggie with a straw? I think it's almost a novelty item 
um, you know, for some people to have fun with. But I, I really do want to stress that Massachusetts takes their their drinking and their ABCC laws very, very seriously. Um, and I don't see this becoming an issue. Um, I did see a hand up from from Katie, but it went back down. So Katie, if you if you did have a question, please just pop your hand back up and I'll um, pull you in the into the room. I, I had a question too. I, you know, you see nationally that in, in some um, locations or businesses getting pushback from their customers about wearing a mask. Have you heard from any of your businesses um, or partners about that? Uh, customers in our community being reluctant to wear a mask before coming in? Has that been an issue here? We've had a few. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think Amherst Books has had a few um, run-ins. I know our bank, uh, one of our banks had an issue with a customer. Um, more so than that, we, I think Claudia and I both have a couple of members who are women run businesses by themselves and they are afraid to open um, because they don't know how they will handle this. Um, I think there's a lot more, I don't wanna say there's a lot more fear than actual um, issues yet. I, yeah, um, but there's fear, right, Claudia? Mm -hmm. I, I actually, to your earlier point, I actually have found that the folks that have been resistant are older. <laughs> Not necessarily, yeah. you know, I know people are really worried about the students, and I'm, I'm finding that the challenge has been a resistance um, in an older population than I, so I'm, a little surprised, but I'm not because if my parents are that, they don't want to wear them, they hate them. Um, so, you know, and, and watch what you say, Gabrielle, 50 and over. Um, uh, Pew, Charitable right Trust has, <laughs> Pew Charitable Trust says it's 35 and over, so. Yeah, so, but I just, uh -oh. I'm really um, curious to see how that, you know, again, I think we need to continue shared messaging. Um, and, and if we have a mandate, that can be something that we can all stand behind and rally behind. And I think that will help our businesses tremendously because there is a lot of concern. And we do have and, a lot of folks saying that they have health issues, um, yeah. but that, you know, we don't really require documentation. So that's, it gets tricky. And I think Claudia and I get more phone calls, emails, and uh, text messages a day about I was downtown and saw someone without a mask, then I'm never coming to your town if I have to wear a mask. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say the odds are in our, our favor. And if someone really has issue and doesn't want to come to Amherst because they refuse to care for the health of others, I think our town can live without them. I've got a couple questions that came into the Q&A and I've got a raised hand. So um, I'll take those in order. So. Um, I believe it's Katie, but sorry if it's not. Katie asks, has anyone looked at the financial vulnerability of the cinema? Uh, I've spoken with the cinema quite a bit, um, looking at different ideas on, on how they're coming back. They are in the middle of a renovation for um, COVID, their return from COVID. It is the, the feedback that both Claudia and I are getting from the nonprofits is that this has been a very good uh, fundraising cycle. Um, I think that there is a lot of support. People understand that they need support. Um, I cannot express enough that your nonprofits and your businesses need support. So if you have the capability, please support them. Um, I think the cinema has an amazing following and I, I know that they're in the middle of an executive director search and we're really looking forward to um, whoever takes over Carol's incredible, you know, literal foundation and builds on it. But I, I, I truly believe that they are going to come out of this strong. Claudia? I, I think they've kept quite relevant too with their virtual cinema. Yeah. Uh, they've done a lot to stay relevant. And again, a perfect example of Pivot um, and they have a really loyal base, like you said. Um, I know, and, and we did talk about, they did try to launch an outdoor series. It's just something that just wasn't going to work out. Um, they had we looked at other options. Um, but again, I think to Gabrielle's point, we should really just continue to support wherever we can um, and really hold them up at this point. Yeah, it's interesting because they did want to do, they did look into that outdoors, you know, different locations and the town was really in, interested in supporting that. And I think, you know, it's hard to pull these things off and maintain safety for your staff and for your customers and not wanting to put anybody at risk and recognizing that um, they do have such a loyal fan, fan base and they're not going to put them in a play, situation where they feel it might not be comfortable for folks. 
So I do. Uh, one of the things that I, I think people could do is try and just imagine if we were not in a COVID world and how many times you might you might go to Amherst Cinema this month and cut them a check or get online and hit the donate button and you know same thing with museums or any other nonprofits that you might get something in return for um, and then the nonprofits that you personally don't get anything in return for um, just think about your donation that you could have done or would have done and and if you can try and double it um, this is this is the time and they're going to be preparing for next fiscal year more so than this fiscal year mm -hmm. i see um my friend ken in the room with his hand raised so i am bringing ken in if you can unmute and introduce yourself please thank you thank you i'm ken rosenthal and i live on sunset avenue we all know that the um, great engine for the economy in this town, are the educational institutions, especially the university. And yet we have people very worried about what's going to happen when the university students come back. And Paul, you're de dealing with this. A few years ago, the town gown committee that led to the development of, of rental permits um, for that committee, Rolf Kallstrom did a study and he found that virtually 100% of the complaints that came into the police department about student behavior in town came uh, with regard to students who lived in residences where the owner was not a resident, not present. For the, the shorthand is absentee landlord. The landlords in town are a business community. And uh, yesterday, John Thompson was talking about the need to have neighbors report problems that they see. But there's another way to approach this too. And I think it falls to Gabrielle and Claudia to do this. You need, I think, to talk to the landlords who are owners of residential properties and have them understand how important it is to have their residents uh, uh, obeying the law. They're the first line of defense here. And I don't think we can afford to wait till people make complaints about what happens. I think we need to be proactive and reach out to the landlords in an organized way, not to, not to try to um, blame them for anything, but to try to get them to support our efforts to have uh, appropriate behavior during this very difficult time. And I wonder whether you two or all of you could comment on whether that would be possible and whether and how you think you might be able to do that. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll lead and you guys can jump in. So uh, the town and the university does work very closely with the large land landlords of the apartment complexes for the most part. Even next Wednesday, I think there's a meeting at the, and, they, and this happens every year with the police department and fire department and inspection services. They meet with all the landlords around this time of year, every year to talk about what they anticipate, what's going on, what, how, last, how last year went, things like that. And all the, land, all the major landlords or the representatives are there. Um, it's a really free flowing uh, conversation. As you know, Ken, nothing's as easy as just like tell your students to, you know, tell, the, tell your tenants to be act appropriately it's a, there's always a lot of complexity to it but you the landlords overall have been very cooperative and i think you know we even had a situation recently that uh, the council president and councillor uh, uh deangelis were involved with where um uh, the inspection services and bill laramie from the police department were meeting with uh, the owner of, a, of an, an absentee landlord if it were as it were um of, of a proper of an individual house, but that landlord was super responsive and wanting and being the person to talk to the tenants about about what was expected and things like that. So it's an ongoing conversation there that goes on constantly. Um, and landlords, uh, most landlords, especially the ones that own multiple properties, are really on board. They don't, you know, they they're always they're always working with the. AP Amherst Police Department and University to make sure that these, that um, the neighborhood complaints are minimized. I'll back up that. Um, I can only speak to the landlords that are in the bid who are some of the larger apartment buildings um, who have had historically the least issues, um, yeah. you know, in, in our downtown area. Every uh, landlord that I have spoken to is very open. Uh, they are speaking with Paul, they are speaking with the university. Um, I guess what I would like to stress is that our landlords, our rental properties, our university, our college, our town, and our community, we all need this to work and we all need this to 
um, be as safe as, as humanly possible. And I don't think any sector of this is taking this lightly. Um, you know, if, if, if all of a sudden all the college students disappeared, our landlords would be in more than a little bit of a pickle. So it's really important to them that this works as well. And I'll just say that we're also part of a coalition that meet, I think we're need, meeting next week as well. Yeah. Um, and I agree that the landlords are asking, they're, they're concerned. Um, so any messaging around mask order or a mandate, um, all of that signage, a lot of that's gonna happen and be shared. So they are gonna be supporting and, re, and reinforcing that messaging. I have no doubt. And we are partnering with them. Oh, and I should say my stretch is a little wider, so the chamber is just is Amherst wide. We are Hadley, Sunderland, Belchertown, um, so even our neighboring towns. So we we actually work a lot with the property owners, even in Sunderland, who have a lot of student housing. So um, and we are getting signage to them. So we're really trying to get um, as far reach as far out as possible. Again, to keep everyone as safe as possible. Thanks, Ken. And Ken has his hand again. So Ken, go ahead and. You're then still in I, the room. I'd just like to then uh, expand on that one little bit. There are lots of landlords who are individuals who are not mm -hmm. members of the bid because they're not in the center of town. They're not members of the Probably. chamber. I, 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 I spoke to one the other day who lives, who doesn't live in Amherst and he owns a house here and he's thrilled that he's able to rent it. So we do know who every landlord is because of the rental permits. So I guess one suggestion I might make is that we simply take that list and which includes people who you do not know personally and reach out to them in writing and explain to them in writing what the rules are and what we're going to be expecting of their tenants. I, I, that, that may be a one-time uh, broadcast effort to try to do it. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, no, I Thank think that's, you, a real, that's a really good idea, Ken, and because there are a lot of individual property owners who have just, you know, they've kept their house in town, they rent it or whatever, um, and, um, but we also talk with property management firms. So it's not just the landlords, it's also people who manage their properties. Many people hire someone locally to manage their property for them if they don't live in town. So um, yeah, but I think the idea of doing a blanket mailing like that is really a good one. I'll check into that. And, and it's technically very possible, Paul. So yes. I, can, I can help you with that. <laughs> um, thank you, Ken. If you have another question, just feel free to um, pop your hand back up when you do. A um, couple questions and comments in the Q&A chat here. Um, Jeff says, heading to my next meeting. Thank you all for the session. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Tina wants to know when bocce on the common will start. <laughs> I like that. Is, is that, forgive me, um, I'm not yet a year into the bid, so I did not experience the summer. If that is a bid uh, event or promoted thing, I can tell you right now that we won't be doing any of our normal summer programming um, in, you know, just keeping not with that, the, is it not? Okay, great. No. Is it a joke? So, okay. No, no, not a joke I at think, all. It's very serious. Yeah. I think if, if it's not a thing, it should be when we are able to safely do it again. Yeah, so like there that. was an art installation at, I think it was at Kendrick, right? Where there were mm -hmm. bocce. And I was terrified of it because I was thinking, okay, you've got these bocce balls and how you how keep, and then the uh, person who put it together is sort of art with a participatory art in some ways. And the person who got, put it together, I think they had um, a, a local business said, I'll hold on to the bocce balls. People can check them out. Cause I was thinking we're going to leave a bunch of like, heavy balls laying around for people to pitch through. Uh, I was like terrified of this, but it, <laughs> so it, was, really, it was really popular. I think and it was Tina, on Kendrick Park, right? Tina has her, she asked the question originally. So I'm gonna invite Tina in because she's got her hand Come up. Come on, so Tina. Let's hear it. <laughs> you might um, just unmute and introduce, please. Welcome. Hi, I'm Tina Swift. I live in South Amherst. And behind that, that was a serious question about the bocce because it's easy to do and you can conduct social distancing. Um, but I'm sure I'm not the only senior who's living alone and is like dying on the vine for social connection. And I don't necessarily see anything coming out of the senior center. And, and I understand it's very difficult, but when I noticed you had the um, cooling tent, you know, maybe the town can put some chairs in a tent and say, Tuesday at 10 a.m., we're going to talk about bocce or whatever. Mm -hmm. Something, uh, some place for, you know, 
lonely geezers such as myself to go <laughs> and have a discussion or, and maybe while you're in town, buy a cup of coffee or a snack. That was it. That's a, it's a really interesting idea. And, you know, it's, we, we have this tension because we're saying we don't want people to gather. We're trying, but we also want people to come downtown. And you're, you've identified the real social deficit that people are feeling every day. I mean, Tina, you're a super social person, and that must be really, it's really hard. And so that's a really interesting idea about um, maybe having a prescribed um, thing. I think the director of senior services has done a tremendous job. I mean, she was texting me last night looking for uh, somebody, uh, um, somebody who knows a lot about sports to sort of lead a Zoom talk about sports for seniors. And just because Red Sox season is starting, they want somebody who's going to chew it over the next day because you usually you go to the coffee shop to do that. She's trying to create that kind of virtual uh, location. But an actual physical location, that's um, like the tent. I think that's sort of an interesting mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. Thank you, Tina. I think you can mark, bocce balls are tricky, but you can mark your own balls that you're using and use them throughout the game, right? And not touch anyone else's. I think mm -hmm. you could somehow do that, but then wash, you know, sanitize them after each game. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it could work. But I like the tent idea. I'm, I'm all about bocce, but I think the tent idea could really work. Uh, maybe some yoga for seniors. I mean, there's something you could do outside for um, and coffee hour, all kinds of things you could do. I mean, the thing I found the hardest was um, if you're outside and you're socially distanced, mm -hmm. it's just hard to hear if you're out in the middle of town because there's so much traffic mm -hmm. and stuff. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, the ambient noise. Is, I mean, that's why I'm inside instead of out on the streets right now because right. it was just kind of loud because all the, you know, there's a lot of trucks in the morning, especially. Um, and that's the only downside to trying to do something outside. I know even a book club, a, t a senior book club outside, you can safely distance. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Some, some things to think about for sure. Uh, thank you for your suggestion and your question, Tina. I have um, a question from Sarah who wants to know, have any local businesses closed for good? It's <laughs> a tough one, I know. Well, officially, <laughs> who do we have officially? Officially, um, we've lost Bart's Ice Cream, um, which is unfortunate. Um, Head Games Beauty has moved um, out of state. Um, I feel like there's a couple other, I, I'm, tr I'm hedging because we have a couple that are not official um, and public yet, so I don't feel comfortable um, saying, but those are, the, those are the two right off the top of my head that have closed completely. Um, Look, I mean, I, I was on a call the other day that was giving statistics, um, you know, uh, James Beard did a uh, survey and they say 60 to 70 percent of small restaurants are going to close within the next year. Um, Yelp did a survey and um, they're already, I, I think it's something like 120,000 businesses have closed across the country. Um, all small businesses. Um, we are seeing some of the larger stores uh, go into bankruptcy and things like that. Um, personally, I feel like, you know, some of them are using COVID as an excuse. You know, I, I look at J. Crew and I'm like, come on, were you really relevant? You know, it's, it's, we're not in the 90s anymore. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, is we are going to lose some of our businesses. And that is very, very hard to stomach. And, um, the Chamber of the Bid have raised over $320,000 for micro grant relief. We know that we have CBDG funds coming for micro business relief. Um, and our, our hope is that with these funds, um, which we're continuing, um, we can give them the resiliency to hold on until our market comes back. Um, I have said this so many times, I feel like a broken record. Amherst lost the equivalent of the Cape and Islands and the Berkshires July and August. Our July and August was March and April, and we were literally in shutdown during that time. So we look at our neighbors um, in our summer um, you know, places, and they're, they're in phase three of, of this. Not great. They're not doing the numbers that they would like to do, but they're a lot further ahead than we were. So we as an area, I truly believe we're hit 
um, on a level that not a lot of Massachusetts has has suffered. And our businesses really need support. And again, it's you know I I, I really express to people if you don't feel comfortable going out to eat, you you know in our outdoor dining that we have worked so hard with the town and the town's been so remarkable in making all this happen. Um, I understand that I do. And if you can do takeout, please do that. If you can't try and buy gift certificates. I don't care if you ever use them, but it's just a great way to do it. And our retail, retail's really hard right now because I think we've all, we've all been at home for a really long time and we're all really good at hitting add to cart and by golly, it's there the next morning. So our retail therapy is almost as instant as it would be if we were going to the stores. But our friends at Xana at Clay's, um, AJ Hastings is coming back in another week or so. They've been doing a lot of renovation um, and cleaning up of their store. If there's any way you can support these businesses, now is the time. Um, and I cannot stress that enough. And we know that people are spending money because if you look at Walmart and you look at Amazon and you look at anything online, those numbers are through the roof. Those guys are making billions of dollars. So take that and bring it into town. And if you're only going out to dinner once a week, you know, try and tip more than you normally ever would. Um, and same thing with your hairdresser and your barber. You know, I sent my boys down to Matt's barber and gave them each a, a hefty wad of cash. And they were like, wow, what's all this for? And I was like, it's for Matt, <laughs> it's not for you. Um, you know, because they missed three haircuts. So there's some money that, I, that we didn't spend. And, and I say that only to the people who can and who have that comfort level. I'm, I'm not saying everybody, I understand. And I understand that there are layoffs and furloughs. And I also understand that the future is very uncertain. But if you can right now, please support your small, small mom and pop businesses. I think the only thing I can add to that is um, there is Amherst Copy who's not going to be staying in town. Um, they have officially announced. Um, I know they were hoping, they're keeping their name. They're really hoping to keep their customers. Um, it's really, it was a difficult decision, um, but uh, they have a space they own in Hadley and a, a space they are renting here. And again, you have to remember that people even those that are in business and they're open and we're so happy they're open, they're making maybe 25% as what they were making before. And of course that means they're also only hosting that, that the relevant um, number of employees they need then to manage at 25%. So you're talking unemployment's going to stay down. Um, you know, they're not making, and they're not making any money. <laughs> they're just hanging on by a thread. So anything we can do to keep them going is as Gabrielle said, if, just buy a wad of gift cards, start shopping now. You know, you can fill your cart with gift cards. You can ha satisfy that same need. <laughs> you can fill your cart, um, but fill it with gift cards from local businesses and, and just help them. So, and again, um, maybe go to that person that you thought of that's vocal as opposed to the person you might be going that's, you know, several towns over. Because um, right now we need everyone to support. I also want to stress, and I know this goes a little bit into politics, but you know, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, it's that extra $600 coming from the pandemic unemployment assistance. And I can assure you it's not. Um, you know, we have businesses in town who pre-COVID had 20 to 32 employees and they are working with two or three employees right now. Um, they would love to bring their employees back. Their employees would love to come back to work. They just don't have the business to do it. So. You know, it's really easy to say like, oh, all these people are making so much money on unemployment. They don't want to come back to their normal jobs. That is not what we're hearing and it's not what we're seeing. I've got a, a comment slash question here from Katie. Could you set up a movie on the commons? Um, Paul? Yes, yes, we could. <laughs> but um, I think we really are trying. It, we're, I think Paul said it best a couple of minutes ago. We are all walking this very, very fine line where we're asking you to come and support. We're asking you to maybe meet with your pod of friends who are like-minded to you um, out for dinner in open air. Um, but we're also, it's a, it's a really hard, it's kind of like the block party. We were like, oh, if we only let so many people in at a time and if we put dots on the road that are like you know you stand here and then move here and you know are there ways and and claudia and i are both very like-minded in that i think our entire careers have been based on it's all been a nonprofit, and it's all been about bringing people together and i wake up sometimes and i'm like oh my god i have this incredible idea we're going to do this event and we're going to have this party and it's going to be fundraising it's going to be beautiful 
and we can't do that. Um, so could there be movies on the common? Absolutely. The cinema looked into that very, very strongly as a possibility. Again, um, it's, it comes down to safety concerns and it comes down to gathering. And as much as we want to see everybody again, and, um, you know, our, our friend Tina Swift, I, you know, my heart breaks for so many people that are alone um, because they're not getting the social interaction. I mean, I'm a massive extrovert and I'm, you know, crushed not seeing all of my, my humans and my friends. Um, but bringing people together right now just seems to set the wrong message. And also, especially when we're talking about the students coming back. So how do we bring 100 people onto the common for a movie and little kids are running around and people are seeing who haven't seen each other and, and we forget, right? We forget that, that we're supposed to be six feet apart. Um, so we get together and we're smiling and we're laughing and we're, we're crawling into each other's hula hoop space just to catch up and say hi. But then there's gonna be a party of 45 kids at a house you know, three blocks outside of town and everybody's going to be calling the police and saying, shut it down. So it, it, we're in a really tough place. It's a really hard place, especially for people like Claudia and I, whose, you know, entire lives have been events. Yeah, Katie, I, and, and as you can appreciate, this is such a, the, the chamber is not holding any in-person events this year uh, through the end of 2021. Uh, the only in-person event we are hosting is our annual golf tournament. And that has come with a high number of stipulations, regulations. Cooley Dickinson is offering theirs with um, enormous safety protocols and we are able to keep everyone separate. Uh, we're not having a separate celebration that we normally have. I mean, things just look differently, but golfers want to get out there. They're already golfing and we felt comfortable doing that, uh, but we're not bringing people together and we're separating. And so it's a whole, whole entire day. I know Cooley Dickinson is spreading theirs out over several days for that reason, uh, because they have a much larger tournament and just to ensure that people are safe distance. So things are just looking really different. We've been talking about hosting a drive-in and so we are considering some other ideas. So hope, stay tuned. Um, but again, yes, we all want to see, I mean, the, I think the beauty of any of us who've lived here long enough, I've raised both my kids here in their twenties now, um, you know, the beauty of being on that common with your kids, or, or with your family or with your, you know, spouse or partner. I mean, it's the best thing. Um, we've seen a lot of people do picnicking out, out there safely and socially distanced. We encourage that. But again, it's really hard to walk the line of encouraging safe distancing and then hosting events. Um, so we're just really being cautious. So Sarah wants to know when Amherst Books will be open for browsing. Very soon. Um, they um, were, when I spoke to them last, which was a week ago, uh, their plexiglass was on back order, um, as much uh, materials are um, in this day and age as everybody's trying to get open. But they are um, getting their plexiglass in to set themselves up. They are working as a team, three of them, Nat, Sharon, sorry, Shannon, and uh, one other key employee, and they will be doing it by appointment and browsing. And I don't know if everybody's on social media, but if you are, uh, please follow The Bid and The Chamber on Facebook as well as Instagram. Um, we update daily you know, what people are up to. Also, both of our websites has a running list of businesses that are open and how they're open. So it kind of answers that question um, and we update that constantly as well. Actually, John Page updates that constantly all at all because he's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I check it every Thursday and Friday before placing my takeout yep. order. So I have thank to say thank you for that. <laughs> um, I do see that Council President Lynn Griesmer is in the room. Not to put you on the spot, Lynn, but if you wanted to come in and say hi or make any comments, feel free to raise your hand and I'll bring you in the room, but no pressure. Um, <laughs> Oh, there she goes. I knew I knew she would be up for that. She Hello always is. Lynn. <laughs> hi, Lynn. If you could unmute, you're in the room. Good morning. Thank you. I just want to uh, truly acknowledge the efforts of the bid in the chamber uh, to, in support of our businesses and in support of our town. And I think what uh, Paul and myself and the other councillors are now trying to work on is how to create a message for all of our citizens um, about safety and mask wearing, uh, one that sets an expectation for, again, not just students, but older people, younger people, middle-aged people, just this is what our town needs, this is what we expect of you. And uh, we're glad to see the kind of support and interest we're getting in the idea of having 
um, some kind of regulation like that. The Board of Health, as Paul mentioned, will be discussing it on Monday. And other than that, I just want to again acknowledge the outstanding efforts of our police force and uh, recognize that this has been, not been an easy time for them. They're human. Listening to criticism is tough. And but we've passed a budget that also gives us an opportunity to look at the future of public safety in our town. So thank you for having this and enjoy. Thank you, Lynn. I just want to thank the town. Um, you know, six months ago, we had a relationship with our council members and Paul and our, our um, sort of Paul calls it the second floor, all the licensing people. And that relationship today is so different um, and so um, collaborative and, and we have worked so hard together. And it, this has been, nobody can deny it, this has been an excruciating period of time. Um, I also just wanna say that um, our community police officer, Casey Nigel and I, when we brought artists, we, we brought 24 artists downtown to paint the really ugly Jersey barriers that are now works of art and beautiful. And he and I, he was helping us just make sure none of them got hit by cars because of course they're squatting um, on the street side. Um, he and I had this really great conversation and I loved his comment about our students um, coming back. Uh, and his comment was that we are looking at the greatest minds of our future. We are looking at our future leaders, our future scientists, doctors, engineers, um, artists, actors, um, just e everything. Uh, UMass pr presents, promotes, and turns out some of the greatest minds. And there, there are going to be a couple um, who are just really young. And um, that frontal lobe thing. Um, I'm a mother of boys. It takes a, it takes a while. And there are going to be some bumps in this road. And we're going to have a couple of these kids um, who you know, don't get it or don't want to get it. And I think education is going to be key. And we are one of the most educated places in the Northeast. And I think that we have an opportunity to create a model for other communities and to integrate our, our college students, our grad students, and our grown up people, students, students of life as we all are. And I really, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to our students coming back. I'm looking forward to working with our landlords. And I'm looking forward to seeing some support come back to our, our businesses. And I'll reiterate that um, I'm just so appreciative that Gabrielle and I come with a lot of ideas to Paul and to Lynn. <laughs> and we are so appreciative that, um, again, this inner, this, this circle has widened, but it has strengthened and um, that we are all working together to make this the best possible. And as you said, the model town uh, and the model college town, I think that um, it's an opportunity, if, if anything, if we can really come together. And I'm seeing all of us come together in ways we never did before and lines blurred, which I really love. I think the silos that we live in, we all are experts in our silos, which is fantastic, but sharing that and you know, crossing those lines to the common good, I, I have never seen a greater momentum than right now. So that is one of the silver linings that I hope continues after this. So, and I hope this is ending very soon, but it doesn't seem so. So we just got a, a quick comment from Katie that says, thank you all. Um, thank you, Katie, for your questions. So I wanna give a last call to questions. We're coming close to the end of our hour. So I just wanna give you, um, everyone in the room another chance to pop their question in or to come in and ask your question live. Um, so feel free to take that time to do that now if, there you, if you have anything you wanna say. So I, I wanna talk about, so uh, the bid sent out, an, uh, I think it was an email or something about um, lobster rolls. And, uh, <laughs> and so we saw that last week. I, I, took, I went home and everybody's like on board uh, lobster rolls. So now we're on a, on a mission to go to every place that sells lobster rolls in town. So last night, you know, first we went to Bistro 63. Last night we went to Amherst Coffee. And we got 30 bolt in a boltwood on the, um, on the agenda. Uh, it's just, it's been actually kind of fun. And the other, the key to this is don't go too early. Um, there was a line down the street to get into Amherst Coffee at five o'clock, but by six, 6.30, there was plenty of room. We went late because I had a meeting and we went at 8.30 and um, still they had, they had two lobster rolls left. So we got those, my daughter <laughs> and I got those and um, had drinks and it was uh, really just a lovely night outside. Um, they were really good about all the all the, the sort of standards that you would hope for 
Mm -hmm. Our businesses have been really superb. So um, we've been making it a mission, mission cantina, a mission to uh, <laughs> go out multiple places. And I really don't want to get this disease, but I felt pre very, very comfortable at all the restaurants I've been to so far. Um, and they're doing so, so many of them are doing such good work. Uh, Jake's Mission, um, you know, Bistro, Oriental Flavors, La Vera Cruzana, um, you know, oh, what's, what's the name of the other one in South Amherst? Um, El Camolito. El Camolito. Yes, yes that's where, that was yeah, Saturday night. That's a favorite. Um, and that was Saturday yeah. night. <laughs> we got takeout there. That was so good. Um, okay. So it's just really happening. Um, and these, 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 and they're all small businesses. You know, we talk, we're talking to the owners of the businesses who are coming out and saying, thank you for showing up. And, um, and it's, they're working their butts off to make sure their livelihoods stay intact. So um, it's really, I, you know, we do takeout, we do, I like going out just to be in there. So again, I mean, we're all doing, I know everybody in this call, I know Brianna is like, <laughs> your front and center on these things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we have so many more restaurants to hit so it's great <laughs> see the the global yeah. dining options here right yeah, exactly I mean, we're I, a destination. I, our american passwords passports are pretty much useless at this point so um <laughs> you know my take on this is you know get over to oriental flavor and get some you know some great cuisine there shanghai gourmet um phenomenal um, we just have so many options downtown and I, I just I do want to stress what a global uh, cuisine we have here. It is not just quote unquote Asian, which I've heard from so many people. Um, I, we got crispy fried chicken, Korean fried chicken from uh, the bubble tea, uh, lime red and crispy chicken place the other day. And I have to say, um, and Paul, I know you're vegetarian, but um, <laughs> really just phenomenally good. Um, and I, we've got so many options out there and every single restaurant is taking this so seriously. Um, they are they are working so hard, as you said, and you are correct. Every single one is being run every day by the owner. Um, they are there and they are the ones taking your order. Um, I think probably the hardest thing for some people is that most restaurants are now, everything is online. So you have to bring your phone, you have to have a good signal and you have to sort of, you know, be able to do that. But once you've done it once, it's really easy. And um, once you've put your stuff in the system, um, it's, you know, it sends you a code that says, may I charge your debit card? And you're like, yes, you may. So um, th it is a little tricky the first time. I remember the first time I went to get coffee at Share, I just, you know, that interaction of just being like latte, cash out the door. It's like, nope, you, you back up, you do it on your phone and all of a sudden your amazing latte is there. So it's um it's a different so, world so tell us what Basti pasti boss is doing so um we're really excited for them they are going out in back of their building onto the pavers that are between uh mass vintage uh, and uh what would what will hopefully return lit um and uh it's an area in between so they have worked with the landlord who owns those properties and she has given them a um, very kind lease to be able to use that space uh, so they are wrapping up tables. I believe I'm meeting them at 11 for their final inspection. And they are planning on serving dinner tonight outside. They've put beautiful tents up, planters. Um, it, it really is, it's beautiful. And I, I want to remind people that um, this is all very European. This is all very, um, you know, this alfresco dining. So yeah, you're going to hear cars and people are going to walk by you. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, there might be garbage, you know, a little bit down the road from another restaurant. But, um, you know, again, none of us can get on planes and go anywhere. So just think that you're in Italy. sitting. You know, so I'm going to take that a step further because when you go to Italy, who runs the restaurant? The parents, the kids? You meet right? the owner and their, their kid is like serving, mom is cooking, dad's at the bar. <laughs> Every time and they're go. like in a full family fight and everybody's yelling and you're like, <laughs> this great. is fantastic. <laughs> but, and I yeah. promised I wouldn't get emotional on these calls, but this is very emotional. And I think that I have never seen um, more kids, like parents, you know, kids are home now, college age kids are home. Um, and they're, they're working remotely. So a lot of these kids are helping their parents run the businesses. A lot of them that I've gone into when I've delivered PPE, they're with their kids. And um, so you are, su you are supporting, and I'm going to get emotional, you're supporting families. So I'll leave it there. <laughs>
Yeah, I loved it. Uh, we ordered takeout from um, India Palace downtown and, um, you know, their kids there and you know, the parents are, are not very fluent with English. So we've, we've gone there a lot, but we've never had a conversation with anybody. And, you know, it was really nice to, to be able to talk to him and, and hear what the conversation is and how it's going. And so, yeah, these are our friends, our neighbors, these are families. Um, can't say it enough. Jeff Bezos is fine. You do not have to keep supporting him. Um, he will make it. Um, but your local people do need your help. I think that's a really important message, and I thank you both for saying it so eloquently and in many different ways to our um, attendees today and to the folks who are going to watch this recording, hopefully, after we put it up. Um, I don't see any other hands or questions in the room at this point, so I would love to give everybody just kind of a second to say their, um, any parting words that you have to the attendees or to the uh, viewers. And we can start with Claudia. Mm -hmm. um, as I wipe a little bit of a tear, um, <laughs> it's hyper emotionally charged. And I just want to say that I'm, um, some people think, oh my gosh, this is the worst time. I'm actually really grateful to be at the chamber at this time um, because the connections are far deeper than they ever were before. And I feel like when we do come out of this, that um, we are going to be a stronger community and really represent who we are and what we do to the greater world out there once we can have them all back and welcome you with open arms, we will be better than ever. So I just, again, appreciate the support and I love working with Gabrielle. Um, her energy, obviously, it's contagious. And uh, with Paul, he's been open to working um, with us and to just support our businesses. And I'm just, I'm really, really humbled to, to work as a servant for our businesses and their families. Thank you. Gabrielle? Second, Claudia. Um, I remember when I first started working at the bid less than a year ago, uh, John Page and Ann Tweedy, uh, who work for the, the chamber and the bid respectively, um, the two of us, Claudia and I, and the decibel range that we can cover in a very short and exciting <laughs> period of time, I think had both of them going, oh boy, here we go. Um, so no, just a joy to work with Claudia and the things that we have accomplished um, through the Downtown Amherst Foundation. Again, still very much alive. Uh, quick donate now at downtownamherstfoundation.org um, so we can continue to support our local businesses. Um, working with the town, uh, cannot stress enough, it is, it is a, a very um, solid relationship and we know that we come at you with 180 ways that we can work together and that we have accomplished so many of them has been really amazing. And yes, this has been a really, really hard time. And I, I joke uh, with Tony Maroulis, you told me this was a marketing job. Um, and it's the antithesis of a marketing job. Um, but I, I feel very proud to be where I am. Um, it has thrust me into this community. And like Claudia, I get very emotional. And um, because of this, Amherst is now my home. And, um, you know, we knew that we were moving and we knew that we chose to move here. But boy, is this our home now. Awesome. I love to hear that. Thank you so much for both of you sharing your experiences. And it's there's, it blurs the line between personal and professional because it's all one um, community. And that really comes through when you guys are talking about your work. Um, before I, I wrap officially, we did just get one last question in and I think it's important because if it is still up, Sarah wants to know, is there still a virtual tip jar? Yes. It's yes. live on both our websites, I believe. So yes, please tip generously at this time. And, and I, I actually did forget to say, please be nice to our owners. If you see something, mm -hmm. say something, but please criticism with a, a healthy dose of sugar <laughs> um, because they are working really hard, but they do want to hear your feedback. So if something is happening, just try to go to them directly if you can. So uh, that's good advice. All right, so we're at the end of our hour. Paul, anything you wanna say before we leave? No, I think, um, well, again, kudos to the leadership of the bid in the chamber. Uh, the Downtown Amherst Foundation was set up to do a whole different mission and pivoted and changed directions to support local businesses in a different way. It's really set up to help get a performing arts center on the common, things like that. Um, and said, we, that's not a priority, as big a priority as keeping businesses in business. And they, it was just really, great to see the, the bid switch that around really quickly. And um, so again, it's when I think about this, it's 
I fear that we're going to be in this for a long time. And I think we have to be honest to ourselves about that. I think, you know, this is our sweet spot. We've got some good weather when the weather turns, when after Thanksgiving, I think we're going to have to redouble our efforts on a lot of these issues and really focus on making sure our downtown stays vital. We, our downtown and our business community will be strong. We have the great university and the colleges in the area. Um, we have the fundamentals to continue on, uh, but we're probably going to go through some difficult times. <clears throat> but the key thing is this, is we have systems in place and we have people in place who are really great. And that's what's going to get us through this. Okay. Well, I want to, again, say thanks to everybody and thanks to all the attendees. If you had a question on something you heard today or you want to follow up, you can email us at info at amherstma.gov. If it's specific to the bid or the chamber, I'll make sure they get it. Um, so have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Brianna. Thank you. Thanks, Brianna. Happy Friday. Happy, Happy Friday. Yes. Happy Friday. You made it. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye.